Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to this second edition of the ITAT Global uh, Online Summit. Very happy to have you all online. Uh, we see that the number of participants is growing, so very good. I'm sure we'll have other participants join um, in the next couple of minutes. Uh, we'll just kick off now. Um, so my name is Clemence Bizarre. I'm the program manager for the Sierra Leone program at the Royal College of Pediatrics and Child Health. Um, and I'll be uh, joined by a couple of panelists today. So we'll be going around uh, first with an introduction by um, Seb Taylor um, for the Royal College, and then we'll move on to Burundi with Dr. Diodone Birainduka. Um, we'll also have an overview of ETAT in Malawi by Dr. Norman Lufesi. Um, and uh, Dr. Hansua Jog Long. Uh, will also uh, give us an overview of ETAT in French-speaking countries. Um, after that, we'll move on to something a little bit different um, about the use of film and media in ETAT, in particular on ETAT trainings by Tom Gibb. And we'll um, finish our presentation, our round of presentations, uh, with Julianne Gebel and Marcus Wooten, who will give us an update from the last meeting we had in January and the development of the e-learning platform on ETAT, as well as the repository um, app that we had discussed on the first meeting in January. Uh, you'll also have time, about half an hour at the end of the meeting, um, to ask your questions. So this format today is a bit different to last time. It's a webinar format, so please ask your questions in the Q&A section, and we'll answer them um, at the end of the meeting. So I'll just hand over to uh, Sebastian Taylor now for the introduction. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Clemence, and uh, thanks to all of you uh, for coming along today. Uh, thanks in particular to the speakers. I think um, this kind of event works because it is the accumulation of experiences from um, an increasingly large number of places around the world. RCPCH, the Royal College of Pediatrics and Child Health, um, as you probably know, has spent a fair amount of time working on ETAT in a number of different contexts, mainly in Africa, in, in Sierra Leone, in Rwanda, in Uganda, in Kenya, obviously uh, working in partnership with pediatric uh, associations, also in Southeast Asia, primarily in, in Myanmar. And I think we've picked up a few things from that, which I think are going to be reflected in the discussion uh, today. One is that um, a particular value of ETAT, I believe, is that it, it's in situ, it combines teaching and training with practical change to the systems of care delivery. And it's that combination which I think really gives ETAT its power. What we have found is that when we deliver ETAT only as training, it is less powerful. But when we deliver it as training alongside support to change the systems, by which essential medicines and equipment are procured, through which patient flow is organized and infrastructure can be changed, through which management of clinical services delivery is more closely organized around the data showing the quality of care and, and the outcomes in terms of mortality and morbidity. When we see these things come together, then ETAT is genuinely, I think, a very powerful instrument in changing the face of child health and child health care in resource stretched settings. We have found that the principles of ETAT being in situ, being system oriented as well as skills oriented, can be adapted to focus on a broadening range of outcome areas within uh, the health sector. We ourselves have used the, the model of ETAT to expand into neonatal care, and then from there into perinatal care, from there into obstetric and midwifery, where we know that these things are part of a continuum. We have found also that it is possible to build ETAT back into pre-service training. We have found that ETAT works very well as an induction package to sharpen the pediatric understanding and skills of those clinicians rotating into and out of hospitals. It has a number of different applications, uh, but our belief is that it must be applied. It works best when it is applied as part of a broader system strengthening approach. That is really 
all I wanted to say in the introduction, because I think most of the interest today will come from what we hear from colleagues in, in Burundi and Malawi, across Francophone countries, and, and, and also methodologically in, in other areas around the use of media and the potential for virtual and remote platform development. But just one final thing to say about this kind of meeting. Uh, one of the reasons why I think we are so committed to these meetings is because there is a chance to build a global community around ETAT. And I think we are make, making progress in that direction. After the last, uh, which was the first of these meetings, we had some follow-up discussions with WHO in Geneva, who, as you know, are very strongly pushing to consolidate ETAT uh, as a methodological approach in pediatric and child health care. And I believe that the people on this call uh, and the people on the calls to come are the constituents of that kind of consolidated global uh, approach. So, so my hope is that we will continue to build on, on these discussions uh, as we go forward. And thanks again, uh, both to those who have, have come to listen and those who have come to uh, speak. I'll leave it there, Clem, if that's okay. Thank you, Seb, for the uh, introduction. We'll just hand over right away to Dr. Giordoni Birahinduka for his presentation. Um, and I'll hand over to Marcus for the panelist presentation. Thank you. You can stop sharing your screen. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Um, if you start with the first slide, Marcus, thank you. Um, I'd like to thank first Sebastian um, for the amazing introduction because my presentation will fit exactly in, in, in the introduction what he just done. And thank you for the team for inviting me to, to speak. Um, I'm, I'm a consultant pediatrician in London. Uh, I've been living here for the last 20 years, having trained in Russia. So I did medicine in Russia postgraduate uh, pediatrics, and then came to the UK, did the same. Um, I'm originally from Burundi, if you go to the next slide. Um, so I'm going to talk not only about ETAT, and you will see how probably it fits in with ETAT, but it's not only about ETAT. I'm going really to show the approach we did in Burundi, um, uh, our experience, and what we do moving forward. Next slide. So this is Burundi, a tiny country in, uh, in East Central Africa. It is the second poorest country in the world. And that is where I was born. That's where I, I, I did my primary and secondary school before going to Russia to do medicine and doing pediatrics. So I'm, I'm among the rural doctors um, in Burundi, but for various reasons. I'm not working in Burundi, I live in the UK with my family. And that has brought me back into wanting to help my country of origin using expertise in the UK and abroad, using my colleagues, basically the whole global community. Next slide. So I think I touched base on this, uh, born in Burundi, educated in Russia and in the UK. Um, so I've got many colleagues in the UK and in Russia who actually grew up in developing countries. Um, and we share experience for the last 20 years. We continue sharing it. And this has brought up what we do. On the other hand, I, I was a pediatrician from the UK who went on a conference in Kenya on guideline meeting in 2010. And, and subsequent to that, then I was among the first team going to launch ETAT in September 2010. Next slide. So if you've been in medicine and pediatrics for long enough, you must have come across to this. And this has determined what really uh, I've been doing for many, many years. This, is, this was an experience of how things go wrong when um, we think in the West, we can go in developing countries and train people, and then assume that what we give them as training is enough to reduce mortality, 
this failed. And that then has dictated, alongside my experience with my colleague, into thinking differently. Next slide, please. So we thought, and um, actually there must be different approaches in improving childhood mortality. And one of them is the down bottom approach. Somebody from the top decides what to do and everybody underneath has to follow orders. This does not work in my experience. When the pressure goes away, people, they just give up. So, one has to think about what is received and think about the resistance to change. Somebody thought that stuff to stuff um, cooperation helps, but even that leads to resistance. resistance. You move from a developing country A, use those people to go to teach in country B, the B will treat you as actually an invader. Whether you are from the North world or from the South, it doesn't matter a lot. So we have to think about resistance. They are there, it's part of human life. And one has to think, what do you give and what can be taken? And think whatever you do, is it sustainable? And our philosophy has been that the ground has to be prepared before really think about harvest. If you put grains in a ground which is not prepared, you will not get harvest. Next slide. And um, as a consequence, then we set up this organization called PTIM, um, which stands for the Program for Improvement Childhood Child Health Mortality in the hospital. And we thought, um, we hope this is the right approach. Let's try. And um, there is no wrong trying. Next, please. So we set up um, the organization aimed at doing three, two to three trips a year, longest lang lasting really seven days. So the people going will stay seven days. The longest we've done was 17 days, uh, but individuals stayed only seven days, but we had them rolling groups. And um, this is easy because you don't have to pay a lot of money to, to send somebody to stay in those countries and people don't get used to um, bad habits if you keep changing. If the message you're giving is the same, then local people definitely will change. And our philosophy was role model and a better understanding of the professional relationship. Something which is easy to replicate, replicate which is cheap to maintain. Next slide. Um, so we thought um, you need to play around how to be accepted. The top down strategy does not work. So we negotiated for the top to give us just access into the system. And then we negotiated with local doctors how to work together by having some collaboration. And our strategy was role modeling. Uh, doing the ABCDE model with low fidelity simulation, participating in handovers, not taking over, but being a part of handover and participating and taking part on world round so that they can see what we do. And we can then hopefully they can learn from us, we can learn from them, but not a forced teaching. Next. Why did we do that? Um, because we are sure that doctors in developing countries have got degrees, they've got knowledge. So it's a matter of working with them, not telling them what to do, uh, sharing. And um, so you want to change really the, the, the way they work. You don't want to change the politics. You can impact on it. And um, you change the culture. You try to motiv motivate people. And we thought about continuous uh, education and professional development. Next. And they bear in mind, the pitch was born after my trip to Rwanda. So I was a witness of uh, the change, the resistance, the receptibility. In Rwanda, I knew that it was, there was another from the top. So the ITAT would work, but only because it's from the top. And I had to think among the 
the 100 countries which are poor, which has got poor high mortality in pediatrics, how many will we have this model? And I thought probably one or two. So I thought we have to think. So we went to Burundi and this slide shows a meeting with local doctors actually writing up guidelines. Next slide. So we knew they had the guidelines, WHO guidelines, and we had to think actually, we're going to rewrite them in, in a way that they feel these are the guidelines, they have produced them. And because it's their product, they are going to adhere to them. So this is a meeting, we meeting with the powerful people, one, the director of the hospital and working with us, you can see how he's smiling. Next, please. This is our teaching, uh, the law of fidelity simulation. And you can see on the top slide, actually we have made one of the local doctors teaching others. So it was about replication. He's, he's shown, which he's watched how we do it and he's trying to do it himself because we want to leave a legacy. We want that when we leave, before we come back four months later, this has continued. Next, please. These are, these are um, academic people because you, work, you have to work with them. And we, I call this working with current and future generation, particularly the interns, because they spread up in the country. You want that what you've taught them, they can go and continue it. Next slide, please. Now, um, so we added a bit of fun. We don't want to go to teach um, and making people do what we say. We want them to be our friends. And you can see one of the slides, this is a, a big a basket with, with coffee. We've been donated coffee. And you can see on that slide, we are swimming in the lake. And so basically we made ourselves part of Burundi community and part of the doctors, part of the nurses. Next slide, please. Um, these are the findings. Please have a look when you have time. I'm not going to stay long on this slide because I've got only 10 minutes. But we have shown by, that by collaboration, by working with the team, we have actually changed the outcome of, of, of children. Uh, children stopped dying on arrival. They started, the, the, the death on day five, day six did not change, but the death on day one on arrival actually went down. And we made a good presentation at one of the conferences. And next slide. And this is the teaching again. Um, we, it shows diagnosis. Um, it shows what else, how collaboration has led to some improvement. Again, I can't really cover this in, in only 10 minutes. Uh, next. So I believe there will be questions um, of our model. Uh, before I go to next next slide, which is last, um, I would like people to ask questions if they have any. I would like to mention that, although my first slide it said not about ETA, we have actually done the ABC approach of teaching. We have done touched based um, on what ETA does, but our strategy has been a bit different. And next, we're thinking that once now the the terrain has been prepared, we will feel confident that then you can bring the it out. The other thing is that if you go to the next slide and people can ask questions if they have any. Um, our process has, has really been made in a way we want um, what we're doing to be a global, um, a global uh, exercise. Pitchim has got doctors from all over the world. We've got uh, UK doctors. We have, uh, we have a Spanish uh, IT person who has been thinking about helping us to do online questions. Um, we've got some, some friends in Italy, in France. So basically we want to bring anybody who would like to come to contribute to decreasing mortality to come with us. We started with Burundi as a pilot because I felt it's easy because I'm from there, but actually pitch him aim to run this internationally to go to other countries. So please ask a question if you have any. Um, 
I'm going to leave to a clinic. Um, if there are no questions immediately, I think probably I will answer the question uh, as email response because I have to rush. Thank you. Right, I'm keeping an eye on the question tab for us. Uh, we don't have anything for the minutes, but um, uh, oh yes, okay. We've got first first question in for you. How can you help make this model more sustainable? So sustainability is is um, is something we thought about. Um, so the model we run it uh, by sending a consultant pediatrician a pediatric registrar, a pediatric SHO from the UK or from another country with a pediatric nurse. And because we only sell those people for a week, uh, you actually get people wanting to go. They just need one week of their life to go and work in another country. So sustainability in terms of getting people to go from uh, the developed countries, is easy because we've got so many people want to, wanting to go. Locally, sustainability is very easy because we have noticed that they are really hungry to learn and they don't like being overwhelmed as opposed to other systems of sending experts in those countries where you go and send them with a year and they, they like you for the first month and then for the next uh, 11 months they actually don't like you but they don't tell you because you are a burden to them we felt that it's actually sustainable because we've got people to go and the local people will never feel that we are overwhelming for them and uh, the other thing is that we want sustainability because we want local people to become the champion of change we are there only to start to get them to know what we do, to work like with us, like us, and then to continue. And then our the next five years will be just probably a visit once a year to see whether the system is still running. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Birahim Duka. I think we'll uh, move on to the next um, speaker and we'll keep the questions. Um, to be responded by email, as you mentioned, um, since you yes. need to your clinic. Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, Thank you. We'll now move on to um, an overview of ETAT in Malawi by Dr. Norman Dufesi. Over to you, Norman. Yeah, thank you for inviting me to this meeting. And I am so excited that I think I can share some experience on, on Malawi. And uh, typically I would try to share only on the uh, policy, guide, uh, policy level so that I think we can see how best we can do. Um, so basically ITAT in Malawi started this some years ago uh, in, in 2001 and uh, we went that one was started by the, our professor, Professor Morin, who started it when she saw that many children were dying in the hospital, especially in the first 24 hours. Then... If you can just put your presentation in full screen, that would be great. Thanks. Okay. Yeah, thanks. Is that okay? No? In the, no, if you go in the slideshow section. Slideshow, yeah. And then just from the beginning. On the left. On the left. From beginning, on the left side. Do you see the button on the left side of your screen? Yeah, on my left side of my screen. Maybe it's my, the way yeah, my... Top here. Just over this. This one? Yes, perfect. Okay. All right. 
Uh, as I said, I think my name is Norman Rufus from Minister of Health in Malawi, and the, I've worked with the Minister of Health for about 21 years, uh, with the, about 18, 19 years working at a program level trying to improve the uh, care of the children's lives. Um, so, uh, one of the strategies which I think we have used for some years now, uh, for about 21 years in Malawi, is uh, ITAT. And the, the first one, I think we started ITAT. Uh, we started ITAT when uh, Professor Morin started the program in Queen Elizabeth Center for Hospital. And after staying for seven years, I think we have to think about how best can we scale it out to the whole country. So uh, my presentation, I'm, I'll just talk about why it that and why, uh, what is it that and why it that causes so good. So the most important thing, which I think we started thinking, we looked at the causes of who contribute to poor quality of care in pediatrics in the country, in the district hospitals and in, the, in central hospitals. Uh, what interventions have to be done to deal with the causes and lessons learned, successes and challenges. And I will talk about uh, future plans for this. Um, as we all know, it, uh, it stands for Emergency Triage Assessment and Treatment, and the, as I said, it started in 2001 at Queen Elizabeth Center Hospital by Professor Morin. And we thought that it should be adapted to the whole country to make sure that I think uh, after we have seen that it was reducing mortality, and we said, we, why can't we adopt this? So as a country, we had, a, we had to do an assessment in 2001 when we had to see uh, about 7,886 uh, children uh, died out of 129,609 admissions. That was from October 2, uh, October 2, 1st October 2001 to 3rd September 2008 in 51 hospitals. In facilities where the where time of death and admission were recorded, we found that 27 percent of the deaths occurred within the first 24 hours of admission, and these deaths uh, were caused by both health systems and policy problems. So I will focus much on the policy problems and health system problems uh, because I think about the trainings and all the uh, all those things we did to make sure that we have uh, embedded the ETA into that. And also, we had to look at how best can we do that, and uh, how best can we do it. And we thought that it should be, we should embed some other issues apart from the eater. So we added other uh, things to make sure that we are helping the babies holistically. So uh, the challenges which we found in uh, that uh, assessment, we found that uh, poor there were poorly organized services, both emergency and routine. There was lack of emergency rooms. Patient managed according to first come first uh, basis. There was lack of emergency equipment and poor case management for different diseases. We found that 31 percent for diarrhea, 37 or 27 percent of fever, and the 67 percent for fever were poorly managed. When we looked into neonatal sepsis, we found we, we did not find adequate. We found that they were not adequately managed. So. There was no no assessment and monitoring of CSA ill children at uh, the six point eight percent of the facilities, and the and, uh, emergency drugs and emergency emergency drugs and emergency equipment such as oxygen concentrators, vasoximeters, nasal pumps, masks were not available in most of the hospitals. Uh, so uh, we. Now we started looking at the policies uh, in Malawi, how do they affect this approach? So we found that most of the uh, policies in Malawi have been running on specific disease approach. There was no system strengthening. Like you see that we have a malaria program that is only focused on the malaria, pneumonia program focused on pneumonia, and other programs focusing on specific diseases. So there was so much disintegration of interventions leading to several gaps. Coverage not only always at the national level, so equity was affected. So we will see that it was being managed in a center in, in one of the hospitals, but I think it could not go to other to cover the whole nation. And attention was given to communities and health centers. That was in MCI and other interventions. And most guidelines were separate. So we thought that pediatric care services were neglected and needed something to do. So based on the ETAT, we thought about how best do we strengthen our system. 
So we went on to train health workers, nurses and clinicians, uh, training of health workers, that is support staff in the triad. Almost all facilities implementing it that were identified and equipped were on the emergency or with the an emergency room for children. And in most hospital triads was being practiced and the pediatric care audits, we thought that we should order, include pediatric care audits in all the hospitals and the, we use the results to improve the quality of care. The pediatric care audit specifically focused on, we focused on uh, death audits, uh, auditing the, the, the cause of death so that we can be able to see the, what would be the possible cause of death and why did the child die. And while also we added on some case management on how best the patient was managed uh, if the child was just uh, not, done, uh, no, not uh, died. Uh, police interventions. So we thought that we should inter start integrating the hospital-based pediatric care systems with the aim to strengthen the system, as we knew that if we buy an oxygen concentrator, the oxygen concentrator is not going only to save one type of patients like pneumonia patients, but also save some patients who come to the hospital with anemia, with other respiratory problems, and with the cardiac problems, they can benefit from oxygen concentrators. So we thought of a code of care checklist uh, which we developed and to audit pediatric care and the pediatric admission form which we adopted from the Queen Elizabeth Center Hospital to each and every hospital. So on that one, we moved on and uh, put the systems in place. Then we moved on to see that I think we had a lack of uh, clear guidelines for uh, 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 making sure that the health workers have referrals. So we worked with WHO in Geneva and worked with other partners in Malawi, uh, like USID to uh, adapt the pocket book for hospital care for children in, uh, from WHO to Malawi to act as a basic standards for pediatric care in the country. So it had, was being incorporated into the training institution. We thought that another approach is to go into the training institutions and it had, was being used in that one and it was incorporated in all the colleges. And the measures and critical care, we added trauma to that so that I think we can be done with that. So in 2012, we started, we embarked on the journey saying we were, as we were conducting our trainings, we were taking the health workers for a long time into the, into the training. So we thought of working with other organizations like the International Pediatric Simulation Society to shorten the course to 200 days using simulation based uh, activities. Uh, case management courses focusing on all major causes of this uh, will have been developed and the focusing on the major, uh, we focus mainly on how best can we see how best can we improve the care of malaria, the care of pneumonia, the care of diarrhea, the care of uh, other diseases which are significant to us. Uh, Coverage, we saw a coverage of 61 hospitals in Malawi and 60 health centers uh, were covered. Uh, nursing, nursing uh, training institutions uh, were trained in ETAP so that they can incorporate it into their uh, ETA curriculum. Uh, medical colleges also incorporated data into the, their curriculum. And data has provided uh, proof to save more lives, especially in all areas, especially the health centers where we had an approach, a different approach, and some health facilities which we had. But generally, we saw that it was uh, reducing mortality. Um, so what was interesting is that I think teamwork is critical as we evoke health workers, both health nurses, clinicians, and data clerks, and the other cadres in the, in the facility. At each hospital, a team, including malaria, ARI, IMCI, ETAT coordinators, and uh, pediatric wards were conducting the audits. Auditing of staff, uh, staffing levels, allocation of staff, drugs, availability, case management, equipment availability and management of this audit and data was so critical. So we found that it was very critical that I think we work as a team uh, so, and we work as a system looking at all elements that are, are critical in the management of who, a child who is sick. Uh, the most important were what were the findings of the audits. We found that initial assessments were going complete, inadequate monitoring of patients, they in reporting to the facilities, delays in initiating emergency treatments. They were the major uh, contributing factors to child deaths. 
Uh, our successes, we found that health workers in the facility implementing the initiative have really fully organized and novated emergency areas. So they were able to organize and uh, renovate emergency areas and equip emergency areas and completed the adaptation of the pocketbook to use as an easy reference to health workers. Some district health officers were funding, pediat uh, were funding and continue to fund pediatric care audits and also some trainings. Data management and use proved to be a, a very important issue, and death, death rates are decree, were decreasing and continue to decrease in most of the facilities. Our challenges we found that we had been having an inadequate emergency, uh, emergency equipment, such as glucometers, oxygen, oxygen concentrators, suction machines to handle basic emergency care for all facilities in Malawi. Uh, some, uh, the DHMT facilities were not supporting the strategy and rotation of staff. You train people in ETAC, but at the end of the day, you find them that they are, they are in another world working as we don't have many pediatricians and we don't have many people trained in, uh, in, major, uh, in pediatrics in Malawi. There was lack of modern equipment for severe ill children, such as checking of vital signs and the small emergency treatment rooms defeating the purpose of working as a team in emergency care settings. Um, conclusion, we thought, found that trainings and intensified monitoring was required for making sure that the system continues. System approach is very critical in uh, improving the care of children. Systems audits reveals weaknesses in the care pathway and we, are in, uh, we were working to make sure that we can do that. And we thought that with the commitment among different stakeholders, pediatric care services can be improved and more children lives can be saved. So what have been the major things, uh, the major changes in the policy landscape in Malawi is that after seeing that we have reduced mortality in most of the facilities, ITAT was, is, we have said ITAT should be implemented in all hospitals and all busy health facilities and collaborating with a different university to conduct research for improved pediatric care systems, establishing a surveillance system and use of maybe mobile technology to make sure that we are able to track patients and others. And lastly, uh, ETAT has been incorporated into the emergency and critical care strategy and as well as oxygen uh, roadmap. The emergency and the critical care strategy is being used to try to combat uh, the COVID-19 pandemic and the oxygen strategy also to make sure that we have uh, oxygen into the system. So I think it has been incorporated through that so that each and every hospital should be responsible for it and making sure that the all children survives. Uh, thank you to Dabrecho, uh, you said, and the other projects which have really supported us to become to where we are. Thank you so much. If any other questions, I'm ready to pick them up. Thank you. And I'll stay, I'll hang to make sure that I can answer any questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Lucchesi, for this very comprehensive presentation about uh, Malawi. I think we'll, um, we might keep the questions for the end so we can uh, finish the presentation round um, and not duplicate questions maybe. Um, so I think we'll just move on um, to the next presentation. Uh, we'll stay on the African continent and uh, look at French speaking countries with Dr. hans Jörg Long. Um, over to you Hans for your presentations. Yeah, hello. Thank you very much for inviting me. I'm just trying to find a presentation. One second. Uh, can you see the screen? Yes, we just need you to put it on full screen. And it's fine. That's fine. Oops. Okay, so thank you very much for inviting me to this, um, to this meeting. Uh, my name is Hans-Jörg Lang and I prepared the presentation together with my colleague Diavolana Köcher from the Centre Hospitalier Universitaire in Mahashanga, Madagascar. And we try to sh share a bit of our experiences and uh, feedback from colleagues. So what were some of the recent or ongoing activities? 
Uh, in Madagascar, in end of 2019, we started an ETAT Plus training course. In uh, Madagascar, over the last years, uh, not many ETAT courses were conducted. And the training program for Madagascar was reviewed together with colleagues from the Société de Pédiatrie. Additionally, I would like to share experiences uh, from the last two to three years with the organization Alima, who mainly works in French speaking countries. And we included essential elements of ETAT in training activities in context with Ebola outbreaks in Congo, or just recently in Guinea, or during the SARS-CoV-2 responses in, in Guinea. Currently, as an example, we are also preparing a training course in Chad together with colleagues, pediatric colleagues from, from Chad. And we hope to continue our activities in Madagascar. Um, the baseline you all know this for ETAD is this still very high under five mortality. Major causes of death are infections, but 30 or more than 40% of under five deaths are due to deaths during the newborn period. There are major concerns that now during the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic, uh, due to indirect impact of the pandemic, child and ma maternal health might deteriorate again over the next month or even years to come. Important in our efforts to improve child health, we should also focus on children above five years. So important, these children also suffer from severe infections, but trauma and surgical conditions become more important. And also the treatment of non-communicable diseases. Sexual and reproductive health is obviously also important in adolescents and young adults. So important road traffic accidents are now one of the leading causes of morbidity and mortality in older children and young adults. We briefly looked at the 20 countries with the highest under five mortality and actually more around 50% of them have French as their administrative language. There are also Portuguese speaking countries so ETAD activities in Francophone Africa exists, but not to the same extent as in Anglophone countries. So I think there's a lot of work to be done. And unfortunately, many of the countries in the Sahel, for example, at the moment, uh, Mali, Burkina Faso, Niger, Chad, but also Central African Republic or Eastern Congo, are exposed to massive security challenges. And I think it's particularly important uh, in these countries to strengthen capacity building. And here ETAT plays a role. Um, the organization Alima works in several countries, in the Sahel countries, but also Guinea, uh, Central African Republic, Congo, South Sudan. So sometimes it's rather difficult to go to these countries at this stage. So linking up with humanitarian organizations is one possibility to also improve capacity building in countries where it is difficult to go to uh, at the moment. Some feedback from colleagues, but also our own experiences. How could the content of ETAT Plus be strengthened? So important is to link up with um, peripheral facilities, look at pre-referral management, but then also save at least basic transfer uh, arrangements. Um, the WHO introduced a new triage tool, which is not very different to what was used in the classical ETAT in inverted commas, but I think trainees find it more easy, uh, find it easier if we use the ABCDE approach, which is also used in international uh, pediatric life support courses. 
this simply makes training um, simpler and easier. Um, some other contents become or are important, as Norman Lufesi already mentioned, this um, access to um, reliable oxygen supplies is important. And what looks easy at the beginning is actually not that straightforward. So we feel that uh, um, treatment of acute respiratory failure needs a bit more space and maybe more attention during the courses. Simple things, how do we use nasal prongs? What's really FiO2? How do we use face masks? And in this context, and not only in the context of respiratory dysfunction, um, animated, innovative teaching methods of basic physiology might be useful. This will help clinicians and nurses to make better decisions uh, clinical decisions and improve quality of care. Bubble CPAP devices are now used in many settings and there are many low cost devices around. Many of them are good, so it doesn't really matter which to use, but it's important to understand the principles of bubble CPAP setups. Adequate flow, we need to be able to alter and adapt FiO2. We need to have reliable pressure settings and so forth. So again, understanding of the devices is important. And I don't want to go too much into detail, but basic understanding of physiology, for example, in the use of CPAP is crucial. Otherwise, we might not fulfill the full potential of the treatment or might even do harm. Many teams find it difficult to adapt to the different WHO recommendation for management of shock. So I think simplification of approaches is useful and also ensure that clinicians and nurses are confident to immediately start treatment and then look at the different case scenarios described by WHO. And I guess there's also room for future operational research and maybe opportunities to harmonize treatments. What we also find in many settings that we actually find it difficult to find certain medication if it comes to treatment of status epilepticus and refractory status epilepticus. Access to phenobarbital and phenytoin in some settings now can be quite difficult. And this is in one hand side a difficulty, a challenge, but on the other hand side also an opportunity. So there are better second line anti seizure medications around, which could be used, like leviteracetam, but we still need to do some work in terms of advocacy, as the drug is not yet on the WHO list of essential medication. Uh, maternal mortality is very high worldwide and risks of complications are particularly high amongst pregnant adolescents. So I think this is another element which needs to be considered at least in some ETAP plus training settings. I don't want to go into detail but what happens after stabilization of, of the patient? So a structured context adapted approach is important and again, this is another important element which can be added on to the, let's say, classical ETAD. How to deliver the courses? I think this came across already in the introduction that short courses obviously are not sufficient to implement um, uh, ETAD principles. So it's useful to have training modules which last over several weeks or months and are integrated in routine activities, are linked to needs assessment and efforts to implement uh, ETAT principles. Training of trainers is important and making sure that the ETAT program is owned by national professional institutions. Introduction to national training programs is important, as already done in some countries like Sierra Leone and Malawi, 
So I think this might be also useful for many Francophone countries. We talked about implementation and the importance to work as, with multidisciplinary partnerships. And during the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic, it's highlighted that provision of oxygen is challenging in many settings. The reality is that in many larger health centers or district hospitals, we actually do not have reliable oxygen supply. We don't even have reliable energy supply. So I think there's an, it is important to invest in sustainable and reliable energy systems and renewable energy can be useful in this context. And the comprehensive calculation of requirements of essential equipment on different levels of a referral pathway and oxygen provision is important in this context. Hans, I'll just ask you to conclude. Perfect. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah. So thanks. That's it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Hans, for your presentation. Um, we'll directly move on to Tom Gibb um, to tell us about film and media and the role of film and media in ETA training. Over to you, Tom. Okay, lovely. I'm just going to share my screen. Um, and Oh. Like 10 minutes so we can have questions at the end of the session. Thank okay. you. All right. Um, sorry, I'm having trouble sharing my screen. You can see your screen now. You can see it now. Okay, great. Um, right. So, okay. Okay, so. Um, The question I wanted to address basically in this uh, presentation is, is why do films for ECAT? Um, so first of all, I'll just give you a quick summary of who I am and what we do. Um, I run a small uh, uh, NGO, um, UK registered, called Picturing Health. Um, previous to that, I was a journalist. I worked for BBC for 20 years in Latin America. Um, and made quite a lot of documentaries and I actually got into doing what we're doing now um, which is very much fo focusing on health films through making a, a documentary about um, a big clinical trial in uh, Africa. Um, it was a, an HIV clinical trial and then I got into making films about other clinical trials which were largely designed to turn evidence into practice um, so uh, uh, um, they were usually aimed at um, either communities or this sometimes on to go on tv but particularly at policy makers as well um, after that we started making training films because a lot of the people who you really want to know about uh, evidence and uh, who, who really need to know if you're going to change practice on the ground to health workers. Um, and uh, so we've, we, we've done a lot of training films. Um, uh, we've just finished, uh, or we're just finishing around 40 films going into all of the um, different uh, machines used to keep babies breathing and alive. Um, and Dr. Hans was talking about uh, uh, FIO2 and things like that. So, so some of the films explain concepts like that um, and give a sort of practical guide of how you, how you um, uh, uh, use the machines and when to use them and where to. I think that will be an ongoing project with the Nest project. Um, uh, we also make films aimed at patients and um, we've, we've been doing quite a lot of public health messaging around uh, uh, um, uh, COVID um, and, you know, not just for online, but also getting stuff on TV um, and some of the TV networks in Malawi, Uganda, Zimbabwe and other countries. Um, and then uh, we've done quite a few films that are aimed at communities and really for community engagement. These are shown on a big screen um, and they're 
quite interactive so that the whole idea is to get a discussion going and get people to talk, talk about and focus on health issues um, and then we still also make some uh, uh, documentaries but I guess if there's a philosophy behind it it's very much bottom up um, it needs to be all the films we do have to work with um, teams or people working on the ground and they need to be designed to fit into their needs um, and so they need to be locally led and indeed the, the, the camera people I'm working with and filmmakers it's, it's in partnership with local filmmakers and camera guys as well. Um, so to go back to the question uh, uh, why um, make films about ETAT well, when I first heard about ETAT, I was making a film about the Feast trial, and I, I didn't know what it was, um, but I started getting some comments about it. Um, it was really a life-changing experience. ETAT is a way of life. Um, and lots, lots of other comments like that. So after I sort of checked out that this wasn't some kind of strange new medical cult, um, I went along to a few trainings, and it was really quite impressive. I, you know, the, the, the sort of building motivation, the teamwork, um, lots and lots of practice, building up practical skills and knowledge, uh, and not just the knowledge, um, was what I thought trainings ought to be about, really. Um, in fact, I mean, they, they reminded me to some extent of in, in many years ago when I was a a journalist still in Central America covering wars and uh, uh, revolutions there. I got sent along on some battlefield training courses, um, first aid training courses uh, uh, um, uh, for BBC. And they were they were trying to get across a lot of the same ideas when you're working under pressure, um, to work as a team, to work together, um, except of course the trainers there got to set off lots of loud bangs and explosions and try and shoot at us and things like that. Not something I'd recommend for ETAC trainings, but anyway. Um, so the point is that um, I, I don't think films and online learning can replace in-person training. So the kinds of trainings that ETAT is doing can't be replaced digitally. Um, and I think it would be a good idea to do so. Um, and I also think that uh, uh, um, uh, 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 films really need to then fit in and complement and enhance what is already going on um, uh, and the way things are already done. Um, so th that would be the sort of guiding principle behind making online materials and films and stuff. Um, so how can you do this? Well, one of the ways is that you can bring real life into the classroom. Um, and uh, I mean, that's already been done in a small way, I think, with ETAT, where there are lots of clips and we've made quite a lot of clips from filming in emergency rooms. And you can see what all the signs of uh, uh, emergency signs are, so like this child. Um, and then, you know, what happens, the child is spotted in triage and sent straight to the emergency room. Um, uh, uh, and I, I think there's a huge potential on this kind <coughs> of this kind of um, ability that film has to bring um, real life into the classroom. And I mean, one way of uh, one way that that happens is in these kind of little snippets like I've just showed you. Um, but I think you could expand that quite a lot. I mean, it would be great to do a fly on the war, wall kind of hour long film with a really good emergency um, team uh, who are, you know, and follow them from a month and just uh, and just pick out some of the scenarios that they've gone through um, and how they deal with it. Um, I, I think that would be a very powerful way of bringing real life into a classroom. Um, the second way, perhaps, would be uh, uh, the second use of films and, and benefit of films, I think, is that you can keep integrity of core messages through training courses. And especially if you're going to do cascade training where someone comes from a facility and then they go back and they, 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 they try and introduce um, ETAT um, in 
um, their facility back. But if they can take away some films with them, and if you've got you know a number of training courses going on, then um, you can uh, uh, you can really um, ensure that your core messages are included within each set of training within each training course. Um, and so I can imagine the kinds of films that you could do would be in a lot of the trainings, I think you, you, there's quite a lot of repetition, you repeat things several times. So if one of those was repetition, or, um, one of those repetitions was through a film where you had a lot of um, real footage of real emergency rooms and you could bring the real life into the classroom but also laid out the key messages um, that that would be quite a good way of doing it um, and it, it, it adds different voices to a training perhaps gives the trainer a rest for a little while um, uh, while the film is being played um, and I think you can also do it to a certain extent interactive and you can include storytelling and I think storytelling is really important, the stories of kids, um, uh, for a number of reasons. Um, it, it, there's an awful lot of learning and there's a lot of information that goes in trainings. Now, if you, if you put all that information and build it around a story of a child, preferably a child going, going into emergency and coming out and getting better, and um, uh, uh, I think it becomes much easier to remember all of the all of the facts, all of the um, information that's being being blasted at people. Um, and I I also think that you know there's been quite a lot of studies that show that memory works better when emotion is involved in it. So that if you you know if you bring a slice of real life into your classroom, then it not only makes it a lot more interesting and uh, and uh, uh, easier for people to sort of pay attention to, but I think it also helps to cement um, memories of what you need to do to deal with different situations. Um, I think films could also be used to some extent to explain um, evidence um, behind what people do and why things are done in a certain way um, and uh, 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 not just how to do them, but why one does it in such a way. Um, and, and, and that film is quite a good way of being able to incorporate some quite complicated things of evidence in um, to give people that kind of background. Um, so this is a, um, ooh, I've gone back too far. This is, this is a, a, a short case study film we did, which these case studies are around HIV um, management, paediatric management, um, and th they're designed to use all of these techniques and and uh, 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 try and teach um, clinical stuff through through case studies, which is how an awful lot of doctors actually work. So, this is Wong Gani. He's twenty two months old. He's been brought into hospital by his grandmother with very severe swelling of his limbs and a rash. His mother's still at home because she's just had another baby. So the idea of these is that you, you, you go through a case and then you stop the film um, and you ask questions. So what's he clearly suffering from, etc. And uh, uh, the whole way through the film, we followed these kids. Um, if I speed the film right up going through, we followed these kids for um, up to a year, up to two years, in fact. Um, and every time they came into hospital, we would film. Um, and uh, uh, um, you, you, you get a longitudinal view. So this is him in his first uh, examination and the questions that you'd asked, all the different things that they went through to try and check out what's wrong. Um, this is a week later when he's a bit better. Um, uh, 13 days after admission, he's still got a lot of candida. Um, and then a few weeks later, and he's much better. Um, but you can take someone through a sort of longitudinal view of how to manage a child over time and make it interactive, forcing people to make the very difficult clinical decisions that they have to make in real life within a training. Um, so finally, why won't you go? Well, can I to conclude? Your yeah. Point? 
Okay, so finally, the last things I wanted to say is that I think it can be also very motivational. Um, but earlier on, people were talking about how um, the testimony of uh, how nurses, uh, how important it is to get people to accept the idea of a new intervention in a hospital um, and something like uh, ETAT within a, a new setting. And I think films can help to do that as well. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that's probably it. I shall stop money. there. Oh, I shall stop there. Um, if you want to see any of the films we've done around ETAT, they'll all be coming up on our website over the um, coming uh, uh, weeks, um, months, and also the Nest films, which are uh, uh, um, all of the uh, uh, films about keeping babies breathing. Thank you very much, Tom, um, for a very useful and um, presentation I think yeah it's very very useful tool definitely films and we've been using them throughout our ETAP training so I think that's a very good transition to the last uh, presentation which is uh, just going to be an update um, by Julian Gebel and uh, Marcus Wooten um, so first on the repository app that has been uh, developed since the last training in January and then Marcus will talk talk us through uh, the evolution of the ETAP e-learning and the pickup um, from candidates. Over to you, Julian. One second, let me share my screen. Hello, everybody. Um, can you just give me feedback if you can see this one now? We can see that. Okay, thank you. So, hi, um, I'm Juliana. Um, um, initially, because the, the um, German ETAT group um, came up with the idea of creating an app and because I had just um, started an IT degree and um, got connected to other um, IT students who were um, eager to um, get involved in projects like this, um, we've been in a lucky situation to uh, um, come up with this project. Um, then afterwards, we also got the request to um, um, create a website that should be um, connecting people all over the, uh, the world um, as a second project. So um, just to clarify, um, we're planning um, to um, create that website um, as a second project. Um, but our first prior priority right now is on um, creating and finishing the app first. Um, both of the two projects are gonna be linked together uh, because you're gonna be able to download the app through that website, but to um, create the entire um, interface and so on um, will be um, a project that we're gonna start. We haven't started on yet, uh, but yeah, that's for the future. Um, and yeah. Um, and also, we would be welcoming if um, you as a group could clarify what exactly it is that you all want from this website and then get in touch with us um, from the IT um, team so we can, um, yeah, get started with that. Um, so for now, I just want to present um, um, you the app that we're planning or what it's um, approximately going to uh, look like. Um, what I show you here are the, the frames that we've created so far. Um, um, Timon and Leander, who are also in this presentation, um, are already uh, have started the coding and we're planning to have a prototype hopefully already next month. Um, um, yeah, where that we're going to send around. So you all can test it and give us feedback on whether it's useful, whether it's working. Um, yeah. So the plan is um, that from the website, uh, you will be able to download different um, guidelines from the different countries because one of the re requirements was that um, the app should be presenting the different guidelines um, according to the setting that you're in. Um, and also to save data, we wanted, um, yeah, we want to make it possible that you only um, 
download the data that you really knew you so if you're only um, doing ETAD in one country and you don't have a lot of data or you don't want to spend too much money on downloads um, then you only um, download the minimum minimum amount instead of the entire um, um, all the all the guidelines that there are um, so you will be able to download that here and once you select the guidelines that you uh, want to use um, you will enter the actual app, um, which is gonna have a main menu uh, with different options. So the here in the bottom, uh, you will have a tool to only select um, um, calculators and drugs. I'm gonna show that later wh what it's gonna look like. Um, so you can um, have a very fast shortcut to what you are uh, want to use in the uh, in this certain situation. So if you if you know your guidelines and you just want to calculate a different fluid amount or whatsoever, um, then you can go there straight. If you um, for training purposes or anything else, if you, um, if you have forgotten a step or something, you're not certain about what you want to do, you will have this, um, this guideline mode where you can, which is gonna walk you through each of the steps. Um, so for instance, if you click on circulation, you get into a sub menu where you can, these are only examples. So never mind the exact content or the exact design. This is just to give you an idea of how the app is supposed to work. Um, it's gonna take you through the different steps. And once you open this one, it's gonna um, show you what you precisely uh, have to do, give you this a description and also um, give you the result of for instance, if you calculate something or uh, give you uh, um, the next action that you need to, to, to do. Um, also, um, I already said that you um, have a calculator view or a drug view. So you're going to have a list of different drugs or um, drip rate calculators and whatnot um, where you can just pick your favorites or sort by uh, sort alphabetically um, to quickly find what you're looking for. Um, and yeah, this is another example of what a calculator could look like. You have a search function and you're gonna have an extra menu for all other things to change settings, um, maybe in the future um, implement more e-learning tools um, but that's for the future. Um, and uh, very important, the editor tool, because someone will have to, um, to upload all the guidelines that I said can be downloaded for the different regions. So um, the plan is that um, um, people who have been selected um, will be able to edit the guideline for a specific country um, from their phone, from their desktop, uh, from a tablet. Um, and they need to register and they need to be well verified. Um, and then they will be able to, to, to create a new guideline, which then will be reviewed by peer review and um, will afterwards be uploaded so that it can um, enter the entire app and be downloaded from other users. Um, that's it for now. Um, if you have any questions, I don't know if we do that now or later, but also if you have technical questions, I would ask, like to ask you to um, give the, um, um, the speaking rights to Timon Tretin also, because he's the one who's more, most um, the, the, the expert on the technical things. Thank you. Thank you very much, Julian. That's really appreciated um, for this update. Um, I think we'll keep the questions for the end. Uh, if people can put them in the Q&A section, that's great. Uh, we have some questions that already came through, so we'll uh, address them at the end. Um, I'll just hand over to Marcus uh, Witten to give us an update on the e-learning platform that was launched in January. Hello everyone, um, I'm going to keep this very, very brief because uh, I can see the questions are starting to pile up. So we want to have time to do those. Um, so let me just uh, share screens and then we'll go from there.
Right, okay, so here is a very quick progress report on the ETAT online uh, that we launched in January. So far, we launched this on the on the 18th of January, um, uh, which was which was good. Uh, we had an Eli for those uh, familiar. We had an uh, an ETAT online previously, but we uh, Andrew and uh, and and Wilma um, uh, were uh, instrumental and in, and in sorted out a whole new online course. So we launched that in the 18th on the 18th of January. And uh, here's some of the early data from that. So, so far we've had 501 people so far logged in and started taking the course and 76% of them have completed it. Uh, so we have another 25 who have still got some modules to do. About 28% of those users were RCPCH members, which I think was, uh, we could take it as a positive because uh, it means that we're getting reach outside of the, the RCPCH, which is what we always intended with this. Uh, however, 48% of the delegates uh, that we've had so far have come from the UK. So I think I'm going to show you a map in a minute, but I think we've got some work to do on spreading the uh, the message about the online work going forward. Um, in terms of cumulative completion, uh, we started very strongly in February. That has started to tail off slightly as we've got through uh, March, April and May. And so I think one of the the, the key messages I want to get across now is that uh, if you can, if we can spread the word about this uh, um, uh, this course, that would be a, a really helpful and, and useful thing to do. And I'll put it in the chat, but it's it's available online as well. Uh, if you just type in ETA online, it's the first thing that comes up on, on Google. Uh, so there we go. Um, in terms of country coverage, uh, these are the places where we've had uh, login. So you'll see quite a significant distribution across Europe, um, but some good uh, logins from Sub-Saharan Africa as well and in Asia. Um, so that's good. Uh, not very much going on in South America at the moment. So if any of you have connections with South America and you think it would be a useful thing for them to do, uh, please um, please send the, the link to them. Um, in terms of the feedback that we've had, for those of you who've completed it, we you know we send you one of these, can we have your feedback? Uh, emails. Well, this is uh, this is why uh, the feedback has been overwhelmingly positive. As you can see, the vast majority of people thought this was a, a good or excellent uh, uh, course to have undertaken, which is which is obviously where we want to be. And some of the positives, um, people felt the presentation the videos were a fantastic learning experience, really helpful in managing uh, children in low resource settings. Uh, State of the art was what somebody said, which I, which I thought was nice. I'm not sure if it's true, but it's certainly rather nice. Um, so those are all the positive ones. And then uh, we've got a few things to work on. So adding explanations to the answers, which I think is quite an interesting comment and certainly something for us to think about. Um, a, a, similar, a similar comment from somebody else. Um, I, I need to take away this one, which I, which I saw last night, which was uh, saving progress if unable to complete in one go. I think we need to look at how the system's functioning for, for, for those people who can't do the whole thing sat down in one go. Um, making the resource downloadable for a PDF or a PowerPoint. Again, I think that's something that we will need to take away and work on, but I think there certainly must be a way that we can, we can do that in some way or other. Um, clearly there are topics that are covered, but others that are not. And the four that come up uh, consistently in the feedback, child protection is one. The, the college does offer child protection training, but it is quite UK centric and certainly something that we we uh, we might want to think about going forward in terms of online work. Exam preparation, again, this is already covered in other courses that are available, um, but I will take that away and have a look. Neonatal care, uh, particularly you know, a sort of extended version of neonatal care is something that we're actively looking at developing at the moment. And then paediatric critical care, uh, again, I think that is something that we, we could uh, we could look going forward. Um, so that's a very, very quick uh, run round of where we are with ETA Online. And we'll now move over to questions, which I think are inconvenient. So uh, just working from the top to the bottom, uh, somebody saying, good afternoon, greetings around the globe from Madagascar. Hello, Madagascar, you're not on my map. So if you were able to do the ETAT online, that would be fantastic. Uh, we've answered the question about sustainability. Um, Andrew, uh, you've asked, thanks Hans. How do you, so this is a question for Hans. How do you and the departments access, uh, assess when departments are ready to advance to higher levels of care? Uh, everyone wants more equipment and wants to deliver more advanced care, but it's hard to know 
where the foundations are um, in place. Um, Hans, would you be able to answer that for us? Yeah, so I, I didn't want to give the wrong impression with my talk. So it was not an advocacy for more and more equipment, but um, maybe two answers. On one hand side, with what we do already in ETAD, I think we need to go back and uh, look at really good quality equipment. And oxygen is, is one of these issues, uh, but also the CPAP devices, etc. And then I think there's certainly a gap between ETAT plus and then uh, a more advanced level of care, which is not a high tech intensive care unit. So this could be characterized by the use of non-invasive respiratory support, maybe low dose uh, inotropes, looking better at renal function maybe starting using point of care ultrasound and so forth. So I think this uh, a slight step up from the level of care we are giving with, with ETAD. And the baseline is people need to be good at the basics and, and then move on. And it needs to be accompanied by uh, ongoing training program. Yeah. Great, thank you very much um, for that. Uh, the next comment we've got is hello greetings from Egypt you do appear on my map so that's good but if you can encourage your uh, Egyptian colleagues to to uh, undertake the ETAT online training uh, whoever you are that would be great um, the next question we have is uh, from uh, Rebecca Moranti who is uh, a former Global Links volunteer so it's nice to see you on this call um, how will individuals be selected to assist and participate with the app so that's a question for our uh, German colleagues I think Barbara, are you there? Julian, are you still, still on the line? I am. Um, oh, Barbara, are you there now? No, I, think I see her, um, yeah. her um, frame <laughs> lighting up. But um, I mean, it should be just someone who in some way is qualified, yeah? Not just anyone can go up there and um, start uh, uploading guidelines. Um, so, I mean, one way could be through this platform, through this group that we need to confirm in some way that this person is qualified. Um, one suggestion, but this, this is open for discussion, of course. Um, if people contact us, Barbara, would you be happy for us to forward them on to you? Would that be a, a, a way of doing it? Yeah, Marcus, I think we can forward questions to Barbara directly. Um, we can forward, yeah, okay, perfect, perfect, perfect. Uh, and the second question from Rebecca is, is the online training set up for low bandwidth users? Can it be done on a phone or does it have to be done on a laptop and computer? Uh, the answer to the first bit is, it, it is relatively low bandwidth. I think uh, I wouldn't say that it's the most low bandwidth thing we've we've ever done, but it's, it's relatively low bandwidth. It can be done on a phone, so the... The learning pool framework that we're using can absolutely be undertaken on a phone. It actually works really well on a on a phone, so that shouldn't be a problem. Uh, um, I've got a comment from Andrew, which I will take away. Saving a problem, progress was a problem originally, should have been fixed. Is this a new complaint? I will have a look, Andrew, and get back to you about that. Um, uh, Juliana, how will you decide which aspects of the clinical decision making need interactive decision support, i.e. check boxes, text boxes and buttons, and which will need a, a textual or a graphical reminder. I would worry that too much uh, requirement for data entry and clicking would discourage the use and discourage intellectual engagement. Um, is that um, concerning the usage for, um, for so. the end user or is it for yeah. creating the the guideline. No, I think it's for the, uh, my, my uh, reading of that is it's for the um, uh, guideline. Uh, yeah, it's for the, for the user, I think. Yeah, okay, for that, yeah, for that purpose, uh, purpose it's important to um, have, um, you know, um, 
what do you call it in English, to have trials where we send it out to uh, send the prototype and collect feedback because this is important. Yeah, I mean, um, different people might have different um, requirements, so it's, it's it's important to collect uh, data on what yeah what people prefer. Um, if you have any suggestions, um, we are always open to have. Um, suggestions or to collect ideas because so far we've only been doing that in our German group and we invited international people. So far it's been a bit um, complicated to connect people from different places. Um, so yeah, but we'd be happy for suggestions. Um, so come and join our next online meeting next month. <laughs> Uh, it's uh, great. If you're able to send us details for that, Barbara, we can put it up on our Facebook page um, uh, if that's if that's helpful. Um, so uh, the next one is um, uh, from Sarah. Uh, we are running an ETAP plus course in Dresden in Germany uh, between the 9th and the 11th of July. And before the pandemic, we used to have one instructor from a low uh, resource setting. As numbers are decreasing in Germany and government restrictions are loosening, we would like to welcome an international guest again. Unfortunately, our contacts can either not come because their country is still on a high concern list uh, for Germany, like Malawi, but also the UK, quite right, uh, or the visa process would take too long, like Sierra Leone or Congo. Uh, if there is anyone who is interested or knows somebody, um, can we, uh, could they get in touch? I think probably the easiest thing is if you're happy to get in touch with me and my email addresses on the college website, I will then forward uh, anyone who's interested to come to Germany to be an ETAT instructor in July. Uh, I'm happy to forward those on to, to Sarah if that's helpful. Uh, we've had a um, uh, an answer back um, uh, for uh, Rebecca for the earlier conversation. Uh, the ETAT videos are also embedded in the e-learning at rcbchlearningpool.com as well. So that's, that's an answer there. Um, if you have any questions, I've got Barbara and uh, uh, Julianne's email addresses, which have popped up on here. Um, in terms of sharing them with the wider group, I'm not quite sure how we do that. Um, we've got a question uh, that's uh, come in um, for, um, uh, let's see, sorry, I've lost my place. Here we go. Um, I would like to incorporate this is from um, Alushola. Uh, I would like to, uh, the incorporation of ETAP Plus into the nursing and medical curriculum in Malawi. I want to know if it's an effect, if its effect is seen in practice. Um, Norman, you're writing an answer to this, but I wonder if you'd be able to just verbalize what you're typing for us. Norman, can you hear me? Are you there? Yeah, I'm there. Uh, right. It's an effective way of uh, trying to bring in the young ones into knowing how to do that. And I think we started with, I think, the training institutions, which are training the medical assistants and clinical officers. And when you go into the rural areas, we have not trained the people, but they started organizing themselves, organizing their system so that it follows the EDAT pattern. So to me, I think it's a, an organized way. It's a good way of doing that. I would recommend to many countries to do that. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. And our final question then is, what are the requirements for the ETAT training? I'm, I'm not clear whether you mean uh, ETAT in-person training or online training. Uh, for the online training, I, I, I don't think there are particularly any requirements. You don't need to be an RCPCH member. It's provided free on the college's uh, website. Um, and uh, you just have to click, I think it's the blue button rather than the pink button, but um, or it might be the other way around. Uh, but it's not a not a particularly difficult thing. So, um, in uh, for the online training, that can be for absolutely uh, anybody. Uh, we've run slightly over time, I think. So, Clem, I'll maybe hand back to you for for the wrap up. Yeah, thank you very much, Marcus. Uh, thank you, everyone. If you have more question, um, feel free to contact us uh, through our RCPCH website. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll be in touch. We'll uh, continue to take yeah, questions by email. Um, so definitely feel free to contact us and we can put you in touch with the speakers as well. Uh, we'll also, we've, re we've been recording the session. So we'll also put it on the RCPCH uh, website, I believe. 
um, and we'll share it by email with all of you as well. So thank you very much for being part of this um, second round of the ETAT uh, online summit. We hope to have the next one probably in the next six months. So we'll keep you informed um, about that. Thank you everyone and have a lovely day.